If it's Wednesday, global unrest tests the White House. Secretary of State Antony Blinken sits down with NBC News amid powerful anti-government protests and crackdowns by authoritarian regimes in China and Iran. Plus, House Democrats make history electing a new, younger generation of leaders in Congress. While at the White House, President Biden's plans have shifted to win, not if he'll announce his reelection. And Georgia is on my mind. Voters are voting right now. But we're going to look at why next week's Senate runoff is so important for Democrats as the party looks to 2024. Happy Wednesday and welcome to Meet the Press. Now I'm Chuck Todd and we're going to begin with protests against authoritarian regimes in China and Iran, and the mounting pressure on the White House to be a defender of democratic values in both nations. In China, the Communist Party is facing the largest and most widespread protests since 1989. Those protests, sparked by the country's strict zero-COVID policy, have been intensifying. In the city of Wanzhou, protesters clashed with riot police overnight. Video shows some of the officers taking handcuffed protesters to an unknown location. Police have also been seen searching phones for pictures or messages or apps that might lead them to demonstrators. In a statement late yesterday, China's Communist Party vowed to crack down on the infiltration and sabotage activities of hostile forces, meaning they're trying to blame this on outsiders. Meanwhile, the authoritarian regime in Iran is facing one of its biggest challenges since 1979. Anti-government protests there have been going on for months in Iran following the death of a 22-year-old woman in police custody. At yesterday's World Cup game in Qatar, demonstrators held up pictures of the woman, Masa Amini. The tournament is drawing renewed international attention to the ongoing human rights protests in Iran, and some members of Iran's national soccer team have expressed solidarity with the protesters. The team, of course, had its World Cup run ended yesterday by the United States in that loss. In an interview with Andrea Mitchell, Secretary of State Tony uh, Antony Blinken said the U.S. must speak out clearly in support of Iranians' right to protest its government. For the most part, we're, we're trying to do whatever we can do to make clear that we support what uh, Iranians are asking for, demanding in, in the streets, which is to be, to be heard, to be able to uh, make their views known peacefully, and not to have this uh, terrible repression that we're seeing. Now, here was Blinken's response on the situation in China. Any country where you see people trying to speak out, trying to speak up, to protest peacefully, to make known their frustrations, whatever the issue is, in any country where we see that happening and then we see the government take massive repressive action to, um, to stop it, that's not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness. As we look at the ongoing protests in both Iran and China, one big question is whether these demonstrations and how the international community responds will lead to real change in either country. But the situations in China and Iran are not the same for a variety of reasons. And the United States' more active response to Iran suggests the White House may see those demonstrations as perhaps a bit more pivotal in that country's future than, of course, what's happening in China. Joined now by our senior White House correspondent, Kelly O'Donnell. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And, and Jason Rezaian is a global opinions writer and former Tehran correspondent at the Washington Post and knows firsthand what that regime is capable of. Kelly, I want to start with you and to hear this White House. Look, there, you've, been, you've seen multiple White Houses of the, both parties walk careful lines when countries, whether it's China, whether it's Iran, whether it's Syria, and, and presidents get nervous about saying too much. They want to be on the side of the protesters, but they also have to do business with these countries what do you sense that tension here with China and Iran this time and compare it to your previous reporting experience? Well, if you remember not so long ago, the Arab Spring, where freedom broke out in the streets and then it really didn't materialize long term in some countries where there was this sort of a groundswell of a call uh, for greater freedom, greater democracy. When we're talking about China, we're talking about Iran. Certainly, President Biden has just had uh, his first one on one with Xi Jinping in office. They've had other kinds of communication, video chat and phone calls, and they've known each other over the years. 
and it's our understanding that part of their discussion dealt with things like the COVID policy. Uh, unclear how much they got into the issue of this tension that is now happening, where Xi Jinping is between trying to keep COVID at a manageable level, knowing the economic implications if the uh, illness becomes more widespread, remembering they don't have uh, the, the kind of vaccine success that the U.S. has had, where we've been able to reopen more easily. And so trying to send that message that support for the people to express themselves, to be able to uh, kind of more freely engage in the world is something that is an American value. That's also true with Iran. Uh, but China is a much more difficult, much more complex, uh, more opaque society in many respects. Then you look at Iran, where we are hoping for more change. Uh, the complicated relationship with, uh, with China has direct communication. We don't have that with Iran. We don't have the visibility into Iran. And so there is more hope uh, in some ways that uh, what is happening on the street could, could bring about uh, more governmental change. We don't anticipate that with China. And so it is that careful line of trying to support the values, trying to support uh, through sanctions, through Internet access, through other things that the U.S. is able to do to try to reach the people of these countries, but to not try to upset the balance of power while they're trying to engage on other matters yeah. that get very complicated. Kelly, the, the idealist might sit there and say, though, boy, Joe Biden had a lot to say about the future of this democracy. But look at Saudi Arabia, look at Iran, look at China, right? Like there is this dichotomy here. And again, our next guest is going to be able to explain that this is not it. It's easier to, to, to say you should be saying some things. It's a whole different story when you have to do business with these countries. The president likes to say he always addresses issues of human rights and the, uh, the, the desire for uh, people in these countries to express themselves, in many cases, to be governed by those they choose. Uh, that gets complicated when uh, there are longstanding uh, structural things that get in the way of that. At the same time, the U.S. does not want to have uh, direct conflict uh, with uh, the leaders of these countries while they are aligning themselves with the free aspirations of the people who who are uh, speaking out against their government. So the U.S. is trying to say, in our country, we have an ability to address our government. We have the ability to speak out, uh, however imperfect our mm -hmm. system might be at times. Uh, but it is more complicated than simply advocating for those values right. when you also have to deal with uh, the, the particular issues that come up with these uh, very difficult countries. Kelly O'Donnell starting us off at the White House. Kelly, as always, thank you. Let me go to Richard Haas. Richard, your long and distinguished career includes being on the front lines in a White House, in the National Security Office, dealing with China in 1989, working for President George H.W. Bush. So we keep hearing people write, this is the biggest challenge to the Chinese government since 1989. Well, you saw that firsthand. Is it? Do you accept that? And, and compare and contrast. I think it is the biggest challenge, Chuck, uh, for three decades. I, I don't disagree with that uh, assessment. But as Kelly pointed out, what makes it difficult is we don't have a lot of levers with, with China. And also we do have other concerns. For example, we don't want China to be shipping military equipment to, to, to Russia. We appreciate the fact that China leaned on Russia not to use nuclear uh, weapons. Also, the situation in China is not yet what I would describe as pre-revolutionary. This is not a government or a system or a society on, on the brink. Xi Jinping has boxed himself in. He's got terrible dilemmas, largely of his own making. But we'll, we'll have to see how it plays out. I think we can and should advocate for the right of free and peaceful dissent. But I think we've got to ex accept in some ways our, our limits and what we can actually affect. I think in Iran, we've actually got more options. First of all, we have no offsetting concerns. Right. Iran is doing what it's doing on terrorism. It's doing what it's doing in Syria and Iraq. It's doing what it's doing on the nuclear program. And we've given up the idea of the 2015 agreement. So I don't see any downside for the United States pushing pretty hard for for, ch for change in, in, in Iran. The only downside might be going back to something like Hungary in 1956. We have to understand if we call for people to rise up, we're not there to help them. We're not there to intervene. So I think we have to be also uh, realistic and restrained in what, we're, what we're, we're advocating for. 
but I like the idea of verbal support. I like the idea mm -hmm. of communication support to help people uh, communicate with one another over the Internet and, and so forth. Again, even in Iran, I wouldn't say, Chuck, this is as yet a pre-revolutionary situation. These are movements more than organizations. They're networks. The yeah. Arab Spring parallel is, is, is pretty accurate. And we have to be, again, understanding yet of some of the limits, particularly for, right. for a regime that has security forces that are willing to kill protesters. All right. Take me inside China, though. And I'm curious as to it feels like with every challenge to these authoritarian regimes, those that want to challenge the regime start to learn new ways to get around, you know, the top-down mindset, right? And so the Hong Kong protests certainly made them, made some of these folks smarter and wiser. But I was also sort of shaken by a comment by a, in, in the Times this morning by a, a younger um, protester from Hong Kong who said, hey, who was trying to warn them, he was pretty active in 2019, hey, you have no idea how much, how miserable the state can make your life. What should we expect to see in... Is this a chink of weakness, though, going forward, and that will, you know, we'll start to see another link and another chink in the armor and things like that? Look, what we're going to see is the surveillance state that is contemporary China in full thr uh, throttle. Uh, we're going to see leaders detained. We're going to see communications uh, monitored and, and intercepted. Uh, I think they're going to hold off as long as they can for doing what they're already doing in Iran, which is bringing out the security forces. I think China wants to avoid going down that path if it can uh, avoid it. So you'll see detentions, lockups, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so forth. I think that's the most uh, realistic. One interesting thing is going to be the, the celebration, if you will, or the marking of the death of Zhang Zemin. I was going to ask you who, that. Uh, yeah. And you know, who was there uh, at the time of, uh, you know, just after Tiananmen, and the question is whether some people in the streets see him, he, see him as a rallying cry on the idea that he represented a more global, more open China. He, for example, brought China into the World Trade Organization. That is a very different kind of China than Xi Jinping's much more closed, much more isolated uh, China. So I think this still has lots of uh, ways to play out. Yeah. But I wouldn't underestimate the, both the capacity and the will of the Chinese state to come down hard, even China. Yeah at the cost of further weakening their own economy. I'm just curious, you ever done your own what-if scenario on Tiananmen uh, back during your time there? Meaning, you know, is there any way, knowing now what we know about China, would you have advised President Bush to handle it differently? Not fundamentally. I don't think there was much we could have done to change the, the basic dynamics. I think some of the diplomatic things afterwards were... Uh, Probably too soon we looked ready to, to, to normalize. But no, I think you know, what you all said at the beginning is right. We have to accept the reality of limited influence and a wide range of interests. So I'd love to see a, a more broad-based change. But ultimately, these dynamics for the Chinese to, to play out. And I think this leadership in China faces some real challenges, not yeah. because of what we are saying or doing, but yeah. because of their own flawed policies. No. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Constituent Services. Uh, it's sometimes as basic as that. Richard Haas, always a pleasure to get your perspective on this. Richard, thank you. Let me move to Jason Rezaian and, and focus a lot more on Iran and what they're doing and whether this is a more a moment where maybe the West can be more aggressive. What say you, Jason? I think so, Chuck. I mean, you know, uh, you talked earlier about uh, both China and Iran uh, their governments blaming what's going on inside their countries on external forces. Something that we should recognize is that whether it's China, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, anything that happens inside of these countries, they're always going to blame it on external forces. Uh, it's never going to be something that they take any responsibility for. So for that reason alone, I think the Biden administration is in a really good position to come out really vociferously in support of protesters in Iran. This moment is different than what we've seen in the past. There have been protests in Iran since day one of the Islamic Republic, uh, but never uh, to, the, to the extent that they have been over the last nearly three months and across the country uh, at a time when disparate groups, disparate groups that are subjugated under Iranian law, women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, all rising up at the same time saying, hey, we want some equality. We want freedom. Uh, we essentially want an end to uh, re religious dictatorship. 
So what is the best way we can lean into this? Is it, uh, it, 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 it what I, you know, verbally is one thing. Is there, what can sure. we do behind the scenes? Look, one of the things that Richard mentioned about China, I mean, you know, Iran is the same way. We have to keep people online. We have to do more uh, to, to protect their their uh, their communications and their ability to, to to get online and communicate with the outside world, send images of what's going on uh, inside Iran. But we also have to, to take a kind of long-term plan, something that we haven't done for 43 years with Iran, uh, and help cultivate civil society in diaspora. Uh, there are over a million Iranians, Americans of Iranian origin, living in this country. Uh, many of them have uh, have experience and and um, ha have connections uh, with their homeland. Uh, but there's also a lot of people uh, in exile right now in third countries who we could invite to the United States as we did with Soviet dissidents uh, mm -hmm. during the Cold War, and learn something about that society and start to build a, a better fundamental picture of uh, the weaknesses that the Islamic Republic has and how we how we might um, uh, kind of push at those pressure points. Uh, you know, at, at the moment, I, I don't think that there's anything that, that the regime in Tehran can do to placate the very legitimate yeah. demands of Iranian citizens. So I think we're going to be at this for a long time. I was just going to say that this feels like they're in a, they're not weak enough to fall, but they're not strong enough to put this down. Is that, is that they the, can't put it down. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the economy in Iran is in tatters. Their ability to sell their oil is, uh, is vastly limited. Um, and, you know, it, it, they're facing all sorts of other uh, challenges, including major environmental challenges. Iran is a country that's going to run out of water before too long. Country eighty five million people. Uh, the the international community might have some some answers uh, that that can help protect uh, that country from calamity, uh, but uh, you know they're not going to be able to offer those those resources uh, to Iran uh, with such a, a, a hard nosed uh, authoritarian dictatorship at, at the helm. I got to ask you about the uh, what's going to ha what you think is going to happen to these Iranian soccer players. I mean, I just I would you know. It was you couldn't help but fear them losing was a bad thing for them personally and what could happen to them. To me, you know, I, I argued that I was hoping that they would stay on that stage for as long as possible. You saw that image of uh, Ramin Rezaian, yeah. uh, no relation of mine, but uh, a wonderful soccer player who who kicked a, the second goal in, in the game against Wales, being embraced by an American player. Yeah. I think they understand that there's there's a tough reception waiting for them at home. Uh, they have been threatened. Their families have been threatened, uh, and and I, I think these these young men were put under such incredible pressure, not only by the Iranian regime, yeah. but under the spotlight of, of that event. Uh, and I hope that that we continue talking about them and and, and calling for uh, the Islamic Republic to keep their hands off them. Do you expect a few of them to try to? basically escape. I mean, I could tell you my experience watching the Cuban national baseball team for most of my life being a Floridian it seemed like every time there was a there was a, a chance to play outside of Cuba, a few players left. I will say that we have not seen that yet, but I expect that that's coming in the coming days and weeks. Yeah. Jason Resign, a Washington Post columnist who, I, who um, unfortunately we all know, knows firsthand the capability of that Iranian regime. Uh, Jason, really appreciate your perspective. Good to see you. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Coming up, a changing of the guard in the House for the Democrats as they elect a new generation of leaders. But believe it or not, the elections aren't over. And one candidate just got a surprise challenger. Leadership, that is. Plus, the latest on Congress's efforts to uh, avert a potentially crippling rail strike just as the holidays are approaching. You're watching Beat the Press now. Welcome back. House Democrats made history today. They elected a new leadership team who will take over in the new Congress, chasing, changing the faces of the leadership for the first time in 20 years on that side of the aisle. New York Representative Akeem Jeffries will serve as the Democratic leader, taking over for Nancy Pelosi, who announced earlier this month that she was stepping down. The 52-year-old Jeffries also makes history as the first black lawmaker to lead a congressional caucus in either chamber. Congresswoman Catherine Clark will serve as the number two minority whip in this case, and Congressman Pete Aguilar will be the number three. 
The caucus chair is the official title, rounding out the top leadership. And it was a busy day in the House, which also voted to avert a looming rail strike that could cripple the economy just ahead of the holiday season. That legislation now moves to the Senate, where some senators have yet to commit to backing it. It's a bit of a uh, back and forth there. Ali Vitale joins me now from Capitol Hill. And boy, Ali, this is when you earn your salary as a Capitol Hill correspondent. There's a lot of minutia, the lame duck. It's hard to sell it on television. I know it. But it's really important stuff. So let's start with the rail strike. Not one, but two bills passed out of the House. And it sounds like the Senate gets to choose its own adventure here on averting the rail strike. What's going to happen, Allie? Chuck, the great part is I never have to sell the minutia with you no. because you're just as big a nerd as I am. Yeah. So, yes, the House did this in two parts here. The first was just simply confirming the deal that was brokered back in September. That passed in bipartisan fashion as we expected it to. But so did the second piece of this bill on getting paid sick leave for these rail workers up from the one day that was negotiated to seven days that many progressive Democrats here say is a much better deal, of course, for these union workers. But look, there's been a lot of reluctance here in the halls of Congress about being put in this position in the first place. A little bit of animosity in terms of looking at the White House and wondering how they ended up in this position, making it look as if Democrats and pro-union Democrats and a pro-union White House are kind of hobbling the negotiating abilities of major unions for essential workers to avert this rail strike. So that's been bubbling sort of under the surface here, even as they move through the process. Then, of course, this moves to the Senate, where it becomes an even thornier situation. There's agreement from leadership on both the Republican and Democratic sides that they have to avert this strike. But when it comes to paid sick days, it's unclear whether someone like Bernie Sanders is going to hold up the process if they don't get a vote on the paid sick leave piece of it. Right. It does seem like Sanders is confident that they're going to get a vote, but whether or not they have the 10 Republicans that they need is an open question. And quite frankly, if I had to answer that question, now yeah. it doesn't seem like they have those votes. I, I, it, it just sounds like they wanted to give, you tell me if this is correct, it sounds like they wanted to give pro-union Democrats a chance to say they tried. Yeah. Is that is that what we're correct. seeing here? Yeah, that's the view of it that I have too. Okay, let's move to the leadership. Because today was Coronation Day until yeah. it wasn't. When I say Coronation Day, the top three we know, there was a top four, Jim Clyburn, who's been in the top three, he, he's basically running for the number four slot. I believe this yeah. would be vice caucus chair, right? Uh, yeah, assistant yeah. leader. Assistant leader. Uh, yeah. Joe DeGoose was running for this post, and he stepped aside because Clyburn yeah. said he wanted to run it. But Clyburn is not going to be coronated. Explain what happened. Yeah, it wouldn't be leadership elections if there weren't a little bit of drama. And certainly for the number one, two, and three slots, this was a slate of, of candidates who were endorsed by Pelosi, endorsed by Hoyer, endorsed by Clyburn. So all of the three outgoing members endorsed the three people who were coming in to replace them. But then today, a pretty surprising challenge from David Cicilline to Jim Clyburn. And what it does is it speaks to the, you know, bubbling feeling here that Clyburn is the only one of the old guard three who's sticking around in a leadership post. There are some people who feel like, okay, it's good for this new group of leaders to have that wisdom and that institutional knowledge, despite the fact that both Pelosi and Hoyer are still going to be right around the corner staying mm -hmm. in Congress, so they exist here still too. But then on the other side of it, Cicilline is trying to make the argument that there needs to be LGBTQ representation within the ranks of Democratic leadership. For, Clyburn, for Clyburn's part, though, he's making more of a geographic case, right. not just the institutional leadership piece, but he represents the South. Yep. And in Cicilline's case, he would be yet another person from the coast if he were to be in. But I've had a lot of people say to me today, what the heck is going on here? This isn't something that people really saw coming. Yeah, but I think you, you put your finger on it. It's like, hey, I thought we agreed on the passing of the yeah. baton. What's up? You know? Yeah. Uh, but I'll be curious. Secret ballot or not? Me too. Yeah, secret ballot. It's okay. happening later this week. All right, secret ballot. That that makes it always a little bit more fascinating. Anna yeah. Vitale in Capitol Hill. Thank you. Up next, we got some live reporting from Georgia, where voters are turning out in record numbers to cast ballots in that Senate runoff race that just isn't going to decide control of the chamber, but actually will have major consequences for Democrats, perhaps in 2024. We'll explain. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. If I'm at the board, it means elections aren't done, right? Anyway, next week's Georgia Senate runoff isn't for control of the Senate. 
The Democrats have an already guaranteed, uh, already guaranteed that they will retain control next year. Worst case scenario, 50-50 Senate and the tiebreaker with Kamala Harris. But the last race of the 2022 midterms does matter a lot when it comes to whether Democrats can keep control of the chamber in 2024. I'm going to walk you through the Democrats' daunting map in a moment. But first, let's check in with Georgia. That's where the incumbent Democrat, Raphael Warnock, uh, and Herschel Walker are doing everything they can to turn out their coalition after their tight race earlier this month. Remember, just 37,000 votes separated them. Since Election Day earlier this month, more than $56 million have been spent on television, radio, and digital ads for this race. An astonishing amount of money. Spots in support of Warnock are more than double, more than double the amount of ads that are supporting Walker. It is just astonishing how much money Democrats are pouring into this because every seat matters, as I will explain to you in that 2020 format. But joining me now on the ground in Georgia is my colleague Vaughn Hilliard. And Vaughn, I mean, I, I just I'm deluged with the different spots that Warnock puts out every hour. There's a new spot, the new Obama spot, a get out the vote here, an attack ad there. I mean, they are throwing everything at this. What are you hearing from their side and the Walker side? Right. I was actually just this afternoon talking with a top Republican official here in the state, and he said it's frustrating when you turn on the TV here and it's back to back to back anti Herschel Walker ads that are impugning his character and his ability to serve in the U.S. Senate for six years. And that is what Georgians have watched over the course of now the better part of this last year, frankly. And when you are looking at, you know, we're talking about 200,000 voters here in the state of Georgia that willingly voted for Republican Brian Kemp for governor but then chose not to vote for Herschel Walker for U.S. Senate. Somehow, some way, Herschel Walker is going to have to make up a share of those voters, either convince those who voted for the Libertarian to vote for him and show up for the runoff for him, or convince folks who voted for Democrat Warnock to switch here in the runoff and vote for him. There was a 38,000 vote difference just three weeks ago in the general election. And now it's going to be about for Herschel Walker somehow uh, making up for this, despite the amount of ad spending you have seen play out on the airwaves here. You know, Vaughn, I feel like the, the problem Walker has is Walker's, the case for Walker in November was Republican control of the Senate. What is the case Walker is making mm -hmm. now? You know, this is uh, ultimately who represents Georgia and re represents conservatism. That is the argument that he is trying to make. On the flip side, it's Warnock who is trying to make the case that this isn't about republicanism or uh, being a Democrat, that this is about the type of character you want in a U.S. senator for six years. But we were just at an event uh, here in deep red Dalton, Georgia, northern Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, just this afternoon with Herschel Walker. He's actually going to be making his way tonight to Rome, Georgia, which is the hometown of Marjorie Taylor Greene. And he continues continues to hit home the very, uh, you know, conservative issues, like from campaigning with the likes of the uh, swimmer who competed against a, a, a trans woman right. in swimming competition, continuing to make those points there, believing that those conservative positions can somehow right. bring out a base which is enough for him to win. And that's why it's a big deal to have Brian Kemp at least trying to lend some yeah. credence to his candidacy. Vaughn, now. your travel schedule tells you the strategy. Dalton, Rome. This is a base turnout. This is right. a base turnout strategy uh, for both candidates. That's for sure. Vaughn Hilliard on the ground in Georgia. Let me just I'll give you one little eating advice. Any of the fried chicken at any non chain gas station is going to be the best fried chicken you've ever had in the <laughs> South. Just trust me on that. Vaughn Hilliard on the ground in Georgia. Vaughn, <laughs> thank works. you. All right. As I said, this Georgia Senate runoff isn't going to decide control of the Senate this year. But if you look ahead, Democrats are going to want to hold every single seat they can heading into the next round of Senate elections, because here's why. This 2020 format is daunting. There are 21 Democratic seats in blue here, 21 states, plus these two in green are vote with the Democrats. This is Bernie Sanders uh, and Angus King here. Just 10 Republican seats. And let me tell you a little bit about some of these Democratic seats. The three most challenging seats Democrats are going to have to hold are in Montana, John Tester, Ohio, Sherrod Brown, and at West Virginia. Now, let me do the math for you. Let's assume Warnock wins at 51-49. Republicans just need two of these three. All right, I haven't gotten to the other states. Two of these three. A state that uh, Donald Trump got over 55% uh, 50 in. state that Donald Trump, I believe, was his largest margin of victory yet was in the state of West Virginia, never mind how well he's done in Ohio. But it's not just those three states that Democrats have to worry about. Look at the battleground state map. Right. 
Pennsylvania's going to have a Senate race. Michigan's going to have a Senate race. Wisconsin's going to have a Senate race. Nevada's going to sound like Howard Dean going on to, to uh, uh, screaming in, in Des Moines. Arizona's going to have a Senate race. So you have the battleground states that Democrats are going to have to defend. That's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's nine. You throw in sort of the next round of outliers. Menendez has another investigation that's coming. Tim Kaine in Virginia, you know, it's a you never know. New Mexico is not exactly deep blue these days. Maria Cantwell, I mean, Patty Murray certainly had a mini scare. And the most important recruiting job Democrats may have is convincing Angus King to seek another term because, you know, Maine is swing-ish, especially if it's an open seat. And, oh, by the way, look at what, what can Democrats do to, to, put, to put Republican seats in play. Okay, based on 2018, Florida and Texas. But did you see Florida and Texas in 2022? There's an open seat here in Indiana with Mike Braun they're going to have to target that. You got Josh Howley, uh, who knocked off Claire McCaskill in 18. I don't think Missouri's a winnable state, but there'll be somebody who thinks they can raise a lot of money against Josh Hawley, you know, to go the Jamie Harrison, Amy McGrath route in Missouri. That's about it. So this, when you look at this territory, this is a lot for Democrats to defend. And these are the incumbents. The most important thing that they're going to have to do first is convincing a bunch of these folks to run again. John Tester. Best candidate they can find. They got to convince him to run again. They got to hope Joe Manchin wants to run again. They got to hope Angus King wants to run again. So get to know this Senate map. It is a doozy, and it is one that is going to be extraordinarily difficult. But I'll go back to the simplest way they get the Senate is West Virginia, Montana, and Ohio. And look at here. Obama got 36% in West Virginia the last time. He's got 31% most recently. Uh, in Montana, 42% in Obama in 2012. Biden got 41 uh, Obama uh, got 51 in Ohio in 2012. He got 45. The point is this. Manchin ran 25 points ahead of Obama. Can he run 25 points ahead of Biden again? Tester ran seven points ahead of Obama. If he runs seven points ahead on, on 41 percent instead of 42, that number goes down. Will the libertarian number go up there? It makes Tester's job harder. And, of course, Brown did not run ahead of Obama. So what the number is is what the number is. And we saw that with Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan got the Biden number. And he did not win that Senate race. If you want, we went even deeper on the 24 Senate map. It's on the latest episode of the Chuck Todd cast. I went through every state. Go get it wherever you get your podcast. We also talked about what's going on inside the world of Kevin McCarthy and the House Republican machinations. After the break, new reporting on President Biden's political future after the Democrats' better than expected midterm performance. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Sometimes we're just going to share pictures because they're that good looking. This is a live shot of the Capitol right now. The sun has been setting. Look at that lighting. The fall leaves. We're about to light the Christmas trees all over Washington. Anyway, it's a pretty shot. Uh, and it makes it seem so calm and serene here in Washington. And, of course, we're anything but calm and serene. President Biden is taking a midterm victory lap of sorts at battleground states ahead of his likely 2024 re-election bid. NBC News has been reporting that Biden will make his first presidential visit, if you will call it that, to Arizona next week. That's where Democrat Katie Hobbs flipped the governorship earlier this month. It also comes after the president yesterday toured a plant in Michigan and spoke alongside newly re-elected Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Both states... Uh, were bright spots for Democrats this year. Democrats are arguing that their midterm successes prove the popularity of the president's agenda, and they appear to be hoping that popularity will extend to 2024. So it's a way to get started here. Joining me now on set, Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today, Naveen Nayak, President and Executive Director for the Center for American Progress Action Fund, and Doug High, Republican strategist and former RNC Communications Director. You know, Susan, I do think that if Joe Biden did one thing with these midterms, is he pocketed political capital inside the Democratic Party. He may, I don't know if he's got governing capital, but he certainly has capital. Because if the elections went a certain way, it would have been, might be open season on him. But right now it looks like uh, there would actually be a penalty if, if somebody raised their hand and said, you know, I'm running. I'm going to Iowa. Yeah. And I'm Jared Polis, and I approve this message. It, it, was, <laughs> it was reassuring to Democrats yeah. because it showed they could win with Biden uh, as the leader of the party. I think it makes it less likely he faces a challenge. We, we have no one on the horizon with any credibility who is indicating any willingness to take Biden on if he chooses to run again. Uh, and I think that the victory not only makes them more confident in him, it makes him more confident 
and more likely to make a bid. I mean, do you, do you buy that? Do you think he yeah. bought himself some Democratic Party capital? Actually, in two ways. One is it ended up being one of the most productive Congresses. And you hear a lot of frontline members saying we had something to run on. They were out there really proud about what they'd accomplished. And then I think he played a really effective role nationally in, in making this election a referendum on MAGA Republicans mm -hmm. and, and putting them on the ballot in a way that, you know, frankly, President Obama wasn't able to do in 2014 or in 2010. And, and I, I think he comes out of this with a lot of momentum and uh, every reason to want to run again. So, Doug, mm -hmm. is there a difference in how Republicans would be thinking about running for president if Biden were in a weaker state in the Democratic Party? Or does Biden's standing not matter? I don't think Biden's standing matter. It still is Donald Trump standing. And, you know, regardless of what he's already announced, it's where is he going to be, uh, where, where is numbers going to be with the base, how much legal jeopardy is he in, and all of those things uh, as we start going really into the new year and coming out of that, as, as these people who are looking at whether they're former governors or cabinet officials really start making their decision-making process, it's not about Joe Biden at all. It's about Donald Trump. And none of this would... None of this would change. If Biden announced he wasn't running for re-election, it, it, it wouldn't have seven more people jump in or seven fewer people. No, because instead yeah. of Biden going to Arizona, you might have Donald Trump going to Arizona and to yeah. Georgia, where all of a sudden he might be a little more palatable instead of maybe costing us a third Senate seat in two years. All right, so let's move to the Democrats. Naveen, do you think there's any after-action report that should be done on the Democratic side? I, I mean, I think there's a little bit to do in that. It, it clearly, when you, you know, lose the House by... 3,500 votes is what it looks like it's going to be if you take the five closest races. Uh, you know, the, the challenge, obviously, is that everyone was expecting history to hold and that there would be a wave, and so you start... So were there bad strategic decisions? What do you I, think it I is? I think it's really hard in hindsight. Yeah. I actually think the fact that... You, it's hard not to come out of this and actually point to the things we did right and what you should be doing more of, and I frankly think... We could have put MAGA Republicans on the ballot even more aggressively in some of these places. So Ron Johnson, as an example, kind of escaped pretty unscathed, right? Even though he voted to overturn the election, you know. That, uh, well, that's a place that I would... And Social Security. Well, I was just going to say, is that it? Because Evers won, does that mean that was a candidate problem for the Democrats? I, don't, I actually think they ran against... If you look at the race Evers ran, he really made Tim Michaels the extreme candidate. I don't think the Democrats succeeded in making Ron Johnson quite as scary as I think voters could have found him. The reason I ask about an after-action report, Susan, is that the most remarkable thing that we did this on Sunday, we showed this turnout situation, this sort of uneven turnout, and take Michigan and Pennsylvania. Turnout was higher in both states than it was in 2018. Black turnout in Detroit and Philadelphia was its lowest in 20 years. So there clearly was an African-American problem yeah. that Democrats had. That, to me, should, you know... I don't know if you do a victory lap, is my point. Like, what's a, what's a victory there? You, they have some issues here. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at what you need to shore up, mm -hmm. uh, you would say uh, a turnout among uh, black voters. Uh, you might also be a little concerned about Republican inroads among Hispanic voters. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are some, there are some things to be concerned about. And also, I mean, the five votes so narrow... Ron Johnson won by what one point? Mm -hmm. Could that was that not a winnable race? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, there are sure. some places like that that you might take a look at and, and, and sure. not pat yourself on the back quite so much. There's there's a difference when you've had a better than expected uh, election, you have an after action report. When you've had a worse than expected election, that's when it's called an autopsy. So they'll be, they'll be doing this one way or another. What worked? What didn't? Most of it works. Republicans going to do an autopsy? Well, what, yeah, just, what is they, well, they are, but Blake Masters is on the committee. Should he be? No. I mean, I didn't understand that one. There were certain people on it. Katie Britt made a lot of sense. Yeah. Here's somebody that seemed to navigate Trumpism without having to do it. Yeah. Like, yeah, tell me how she did it. Brian Kemp should be on that list. Why Blake Masters? I, I don't understand it. Okay. I've talked to folks who are, who are working on this. I'm going to contribute some thoughts. Right, Henry Barber is running this. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. He's a guy who's always a strategy. I assume all of out. my recommendations will be discarded pretty quickly. But <laughs> uh, look, we have to learn lessons. And we Republicans quite often don't want to learn lessons. We just want to kind of keep moving forward. But when you've underperformed, you have to make changes. You know we who just won't don't pay know attention to an autopsy? <laughs> Donald Trump, mm -hmm. right? So does it matter if you do an autopsy if the person who's the face of your party isn't paying attention? Does, you still have to do your due diligence, you know, that the cool, you know, that the Kool-Aid man is going to run through the wall and mess everything up again is something that may happen. But you still have to do your due diligence. I want to bring up, you know, Donald Trump. What I'm trying to figure out is he is he a dog that will bite with no teeth? Is he or is he really an alligator and you better not get in the water? So Nikki Haley, you know, tossed about she was thinking about running and they go to the Trump campaign for a statement. And this is what he gave the AP uh, through his spokesperson.
Unfortunate to see politicians who President Trump made relevant use 2024 as life support for their political career. Is there, does anybody want to be first? No. Yeah, the first one in to challenge Trump for the primary. I, I, I don't know that they, I mean, I think the challenge they have in, with each of them is they want his base. <laughs> Every single one of them wants They his don't want supporters. to alienate his supporters. They certainly don't want to yeah. alienate his supporters. And so they, you know, even the dance that's been happening over the last week since he had dinner is, you know, trying to denounce Fuentes, right. but not saying anything about Trump. I mean, it is pretty astounding that this wasn't a bright line. Not one Republican, except for Pat Toomey, who I've seen, said, I won't vote for the guy. Mitch McConnell. No, refused, no, no. Mitch McConnell says, I don't think he can win. But he, also, he, he declined to engage on whether he would vote for him <laughs> again. And uh, that's not exactly a no, I won't vote for him again, but it's, it's pretty close. No, I think that's, that to me, that's the line that should have been drawn is that you, you, they're not willing to say they won't vote for him. Because here's the thing. Mitch McConnell, if Donald Trump wins the primary, Mitch McConnell is going to support him. I think that's it's what I mean, I, Doug, I think this has been why there have been Republicans have been trying to figure out how to. Because they all don't want to look like Mike Lee, mm -hmm. right? Mike Lee looked ridiculous in these re-election ads that 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 uh, they were able to run against him because he sat there and said he's morally unfit, and then he had to come groveling back. Mm -hmm. I I feel like you see all these Republicans going, well, I'm going to condemn everything, but I can't sit here and say I'll never support him because. He might be the nominee. Right. How many action films have we seen where there are two people on a cliff and one says the other, OK, you go first. <laughs> That's where Republicans are right now, because they know that Trump will go after them and go after them hard. And he's effective. You know, at it. Eight he's of them should announce on the same day. Like they all should actually. This is That's the case. That's a problem. Yeah. See, this, right. is, this is where we've backed ourselves into one, if not more corners. If eight yeah. announce on the first day, if it's Donald Trump versus eight, guess who wins? Donald Trump. Yeah. We have a lot of challenges here, and the calculus and the algebra is really difficult. Let me ask you this. Uh, Matt Bai had a piece, and he sort of implied, Naveen, that, you know, you can, until he annou until Biden announces that he's running, should you can you be a Democrat and test the waters and basically say, look, I'm not running against Joe Biden, but I'm, I want to, you know, I want to be prepared. I actually think there's no advantage to this right now. I actually think the, the stakes for Democrats are really clear about what the risk is if you know, you see in weakening your incumbent is just a bad idea or just the making it easier for Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis mm -hmm. to have a pathway to the presidency. I think people get the stakes. I think abortion really heightened that mm -hmm. the fact that a national ban on abortion is on the table. I think the, the unity you saw for Democrats just in reelecting or in electing a new speakership or leadership heightens how much they want to be together. But it's that same election of new leadership, Susan, that makes you wonder, are there's going to be itching for new leadership? Well, there's some itching for new leadership uh, nationally, but who? And will they, w would they be as strong as Joe Biden, especially against a race with Donald Trump? Joe Biden having already defeated uh, D Donald Trump? I mean, that's the trouble. All I Democrats. think about, I don't know if you saw this, but it's the horror movie trailer that SNL did a few <laughs> weeks ago about Biden 2024. And it starts out with, oh, my God, I don't know if he can win. And by the end, they're like, well, no one else can. Yeah. I guess we got to get behind Well, Biden. that was a calculation And it's sort of the fun, whole, right? yeah. they go through that. It's a, yeah. If you haven't seen it, yeah. it's better. No offense. I think we do great analysis here. The form is, <laughs> yeah. It's going, it explains the whole Democratic mm -hmm. dilemma better than anything I've seen. You know what Democrats remember? Jimmy Carter, George H.W. Bush. Yep. They had challenges within their party for a, their bid yes. for a second term, and it cost them. It's, uh, it's pretty much a truism, it seems like, at least in the modern era. Naveen, Doug, Susan, thank you. Up next, Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. will join me right here on set on the growing political power of Native American tribes around the country. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Hundreds of Native American leaders gathered at the White House today for a Tribal Nation Summit. Interior Secretary Deb Holland, the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary on any level, spoke alongside Vice President Harris and President Biden. In his speech, President Biden reaffirmed his commitment to respect for Native tribes and announced increased investment in Native communities. Respect means we'll defend tribal sovereignty and self-government and self-determination. And we'll and we'll support tribal economy and keep fighting for better tribal health care, child care, education, housing, public safety, and so much more. And respect means being there in person to show it. I'm joined now by the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Uh, chief Hoskin, thank you for coming here. It's good to be here, Chuck. Let me start with um, what the larger picture here, which is it, it's... I mean, talk multiple days late and a dollar short, but it does feel as if 
the government, the U.S. government in general, is is trying to do better uh, with Native communities and, and tribal nations. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. I mean, we've got a long ways to go, yeah. uh, but the president said it best in one word, and that's respect, and that's the baseline of what tribes deserve. If you look at the long history of the country, there's plenty of uh, reasons mm-hmm. to point to injustice, uh, injury imposed on Native peoples, just some of the worst atrocities that uh, any people have inflicted on another, but we are on a path of progress. It, it, how would you explain the path of progress? Mm-hmm. It, from my standpoint, it looks like you had to do it the old-fashioned way. You had, to, you had to achieve some political power. And sometimes that comes with money. Be pure and simple. And the more political power you have, the more respect suddenly people pay. I mean, that's true. And that's, you know, and some, some people would say, well, that's how Washington, D.C. works. So I, I think as tribes and Cherokee Nation, as example, have uh, gained prosperity financially, we've mm-hmm. gained political strength, and we've leveraged that to really good things, which is better public policy. But even if you go back, uh, let's say, to the 1970s, where mm-hmm. there were some major reforms, tribes, including Cherokee Nation, were not in the position we are now, yet we had some champions. I mean, we, yeah. we had some champions in but Washington, D.C. But you got rolled more often than not. True, you, true. Right? But some of those reforms at least opened the door to self-determination. That self-determination has put us in a position to do what we always could do, which right. was chart our own destiny and gain some strength. I want to talk about something that's, I know, a passion of you, which is sort of preserving the language. Mm-hmm. So what, what can the U.S. government do more to help with this? Well, first of all, recognize, and the country should recognize, that the reason we, that native languages are endangered is because the United States purposefully made them endangered through federal Indian policy. We have to say it. We have to say it plain and acknowledge This is what happened, basically, from the 1850s to the 1970s, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so now you take Cherokee Nation, largest tribe in the United States, 441,000 citizens. Most Cherokees are like their chief. They don't speak Cherokee. We have mm-hmm. 2,000 fluent speakers left most over the age of 70. Time is not on our side. So what we need is more resources because we have strategies to save our language. We got some of the best and brightest language preservation specialists who are Cherokee working on this every day. I, I think this is one of the most important missions any country in the world's ever taken on, the Cherokee Nation saving its language, but we need some more resources. And should, should this go a, a step further? What, what more does the U.S. government owe tribal nations for eradicating these languages? Well, I, I, you know, it's easy to say they need to put more money into programs, but I also think that there can be better recognition in these federal agencies that this is a mission that the country ought to undertake. The country has responsibility for this. It ought to be part of the nation's interest to save native languages. And I think for most Americans, it's fairly obscure. It's not top of their mind, but leaders can make it top of the top of oh, mind. You can find plenty of public schools that will teach you Mandarin. I said not plenty, but in some places. Right. If you found one that's going to teach, Cher- teach Cherokee? You know, that is changing back yeah. home in Oklahoma, but we need it to change more. In fact, you could go back a few decades and schools didn't want to teach it. Now mm-hmm. they actually want to. Let's talk about seating a member of Congress. Mm-hmm. This is something that I thought was going to happen. Where, where does this stand? I mean, I've had the representative yeah. on the show. Right. And she, we're, she seemed cautiously optimistic. Mm-hmm. Well, what say you? I still think it can happen, and I think it can happen before the year's in here in the lame duck session. I mean, we made substantial progress at the Rules Committee hearing mm-hmm. uh, just a few weeks ago, but we've been working on and this You only for need a, a vote of the years. House on this, right? Just a vote of the House. You don't need, this isn't something that's bicameral, right? Right. right. Well, here, here's what I think. The Senate did this almost 200 years ago when they ratified the treaty that removed the Cherokee people. Now it's time for the House to finish its part of it. Interesting. Uh, when you move to this sort of this generation, this generation of leaders, it does feel as if you go back 20 years that you, you and your other peers really have learned a lot of hard lessons uh, on, on how to do this. And it feels like the leveraging of political power has never been more effective. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, we have friends on a bipartisan basis. I think about my father's generation. He served in tribal government. I think about my grandfather, who mm-hmm. served in a generation where Cherokee Nation's government was so suppressed we couldn't operate. Here I am today leading the largest tribe in the country. I feel like we're in a position of relative strength. We just have to use that for good public policy. And what, what comes next? I mean, is, is there, you know, if you, you get this respect, you get this recognition... What comes next? Building the economy even more, bringing more people back to the nation? Absolutely. There's still parts of the Cherokee Nation where the economy is not very good. There's still parts of the Cherokee Nation where we have elders living in conditions they shouldn't be living in. I'm talking about housing and basic infrastructure. I can take you to a town where there's no cell service. We're going to change that thanks to some federal law and our own resources. We have to make sure that Native Americans are not left behind in this country, and they still are, but we can change it. 
Thanks for coming in. It's good to see you. Uh, you. This event today, I know, a big deal. Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Uh, thanks for uh, getting your, giving us your perspective. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.